Okay. So, hello, and welcome back to Angry Plays Metroid Prime. Um, I guess this is session two. Session one has been put up to the YouTube channel, my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash theangrydm. So feel free to go check that out if you missed it. I have tightened my wrist strap so as to avoid injury. But I like that the guy in the little picture thing allow adequate room around you and he's like roundhousing everything in the room. It's like, you know what? I could not get that into a video game. No matter how hard I tried. I, I would not be a danger to people around me. Even with motion controls. I guess part of it is because I'm lazy, which is why, you know, this is Angry Plays Metroid Prime and not, hey, let's let's go do track and field events with Angry. Also because Steadicam mounts are really expensive. So, in the last episode, we answered a distress call to a space pirate frigate that had been conducting biological experiments using something called Phazon, and the creatures had gotten out of control and destroyed the ship. Samus came, responded to the distress beacon, finished off all of the survivors, and made sure the ship exploded, which is the proper response to a distress call. Um, just before leaving the ship, she found her arch nemesis Ridley of the Space Pirates was on board, and pursued him to the planet Talon 4 where she began searching him through Talon 4's jungles and eventually found a ruined temple that belonged to the ancient Chozo bird people who had trained her and created her power suit. Um, which, yeah, so there's that. We wandered around, we got the charge beam, the morph ball, the morph ball bomb, because all of Samus's equipment was damaged in the explosion of the space frigate. Um... And also, as we wandered around, we started learning some of the history of Talon IV and the Chozo, uh, including that at some point... Uh, just turn down my volume here. Okay. Which is why Sam... Sam has just suddenly got this, this spacey look and started staring at the ceiling. She was trying to remember which button operates her helmet... Uh, her helmet sound pickup, whatever. That joke kind of failed. Anyway, so, the whole thing, uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to wander around briefly and just grab a few of the pickups in the Chozo Ruins here, um, and then we are going to head to the next, uh, next spot along the, what we can call the critical path of the game. Um, and th you know what, that's, that's actually a, a term I use a lot, whoop, all the water here, by the way, is poisonous. Um, I use the term critical path a lot. Um, in a lot of video games where you have a, sort of the ability to explore and there are side paths and stuff, um, generally when they design the, the levels or, you know, design the scenarios, um, they lay out what they expect to be sort of the proper path through the area and then build side paths, build side paths off of it. And so you can, you call that, that main path, the main intended path, the critical path. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that the game has to be linear. Um, it just, it helps you focus, whoop, that guy gets a little zippy when they get shot at. It just sort of helps you focus the design a little bit. I, I, I say this like I'm a video game designer. But the reason I bring it up is because there's a lot of parallels to dungeon and site-based adventure design for D&D. &D. And we're just going to go ahead and take the hits from the, the scarabs at this point. We're making our way back to the main plaza to pick up some of the... Some of the, um... Some of the missile tanks that we couldn't get. And... I th I'm trying to do this from memory, but I do have a checklist... Because I am attempting to 100% this. But 
Anyway, getting back to the whole idea of a critical path. So, you design your game around this critical path, and then you spread... You spread the sort of optional areas off of that. And, you know, even... And also, you let people, like, deviate from the critical path and take things in a different sequence. That's fine. But by designing to a critical path, it lets you tighten up your design. So I, I keep referring to the critical path of this game because the game sort of tells you what it is in that every time you start to flail and get lost, the game tells you which, what area to head to to get the next major pickup, you know, the next major power-up. And while we're on the subject, you can kind of divide the power-ups in this game into two two categories. There are the the major power-ups that actually change your abilities, uh, allow you to access new areas. Well, you followed me in here? Good on you. That was one dedicated little beetle, huh? Hmm. Alright, we have a slight infestation. Get out of that tunnel, it is for morph balls only. There we go. Oh, there's... Damn it! I don't mess around with raid, I just go right to morph ball explosives. So anyway, whoops. Get in there. Okay, so the, the power-ups in this game can be divided into two major classifications. Um... There are the major power-ups that that change your abilities in some way that... I think I used the phrase when we were talking about Super Metroid about adding verbs. Uh, that is to say, they, they give you new abilities. They don't just power you up. Um, and we're going to talk about that more when we start getting additional beam weapons. But you can think of a verb as an action that you can that you can complete in the game. So, you know, a lot of the a lot of the abilities in this game, like like the morph ball, gives you the ability to curl up into a ball. You can fit into tighter spaces. Um, it also makes you a little bit faster, so you can use it to evade enemies. Um, and it, it's kind of a neat tool because because it has that little extra bit of versatility. It's not just like if Metroid were a little bit more clumsy design then the, metro the Morph Ball would only be useful because there were certain areas of the game that were too tight for you to crawl into. But the idea that they actually made it also a little bit faster and it makes your hitbox smaller, um, and also it changes your view, it gives you a third-person mode, it actually makes it uh, a tool for evasion. So it's not just a key. And in general, that's one of the strengths of Metroid's power-ups, is that very rarely do you get something that is just... that just unlocks an area. Um, and that's that's kind of important, too, in... Um, like, in D&D, &D, a lot of people complain about how boring the... Um, like, magic... I, whoop, let me... give me one second. Because we can see that there's actually... If you listen, there's a hidden missile pickup up there, because you can hear the... Wah. And we can see these morph ball tracks along the walls. And also if we drop into the scan visor, we can see that there are these sandstone blocks in the way. Um, and sandstone, we, we learn by experimenting, is vulnerable to the morph ball bomb. Whoops. So we're going to bounce up here. Blow that up. And then we should be able to get through this track. So anyway, one of the big complaints that people have about D&D &D is that magic items that simply give you, like, a bonus to a stat, whether it's attack or a particular skill or whatever, are kind of dull. And the, part of the reason for that is, is, this, is the same reason that just finding a key in a video game is kind of dull. It doesn't really give you any new capabilities. It just makes you better at what you can already do. Um, you know, it's that whole idea of adding verbs. So, you know, 
even something as simple as like a flaming longsword is neater than just a longsword because in theory you have all the capabilities of you know that a basically carrying a flaming you know basically carrying a rod made of fire would would give you like you know igniting combustibles or lighting torches or whatever it might be and a lot of dms actually make the mistake of ignoring those secondary effects in fact one of the one of the i'm going to go ahead and say one of the weaknesses of 4th edition D&D was that it tended to reduce everything down to a single power you know a single stat block a single power with a single use and it avoided all those all those other versatile uses that you might find for a thing so a flaming longsword defined exactly what it did and kind of implicit in the way the rules were structured was and that was all it did you know it didn't do anything else and i know that that's not entirely true that's not entirely fair because a lot of it is how you read the game and how you personally choose to run it but at the same time the the structure of the rules just gave that implication now we're heading back to the vault where i think there was one more missile pickup um, that we couldn't get without the Morph Ball and the Morph Ball Bomb. I also like, um, another thing that accounts for, uh, a problem that a lot of first-person games have. Uh, I think I mentioned this before, that in a first-person game, one of the problems that you run into is that your character has no peripheral vision. Because, you know, in real life, you can see, you can see a bit, about a 120 degree arc around you. So, so, you know, more than just the flat plane directly in front of you. But video games can't emulate that. Whoops, rolled off there. Video games can't emulate that. So you find that a lot of first person games are constantly looking for ways to fix the peripheral vision problem. And Metroid Prime does two things, um, one which has become very common and one that isn't so common. Uh, I, actually, I guess the other one is not is common too. I shouldn't even say that. I don't know what I'm talking about. Alright, so number one um, is you, you have in the upper left, you have that little miniature radar. And interestingly enough, you note that it goes away when you're in morph ball mode because, in theory, you don't need it as much because you can see a bigger arc around around Samus when the morph ball is active. But that little radar, um, that little radar just tells you where enemies are in relation to you. Um, the other thing, and you'll see it more when I get to something, when I get near something dangerous, but is the little exclamation point on the left which shows how close I am to something that can hurt me like fire or poison or whatever um and you know those two things together kind of help compensate for a, a little lack of awareness of your environment alright uh so that All right, I think I got all of the optional pickups I can grab at this point. The, all the missiles and the energy tanks, I hope. So I'm gonna cut back through the main chain, main plaza. I'm gonna hit the save point just in case, and then we're gonna carry on. I actually just started um playing Metroid Prime 2, which is one that I had never completed, and it, it's funny, it's based on the same, the same engine, the same control scheme, but it makes a few changes, particularly to the scanning, that are really effective, and yet, there are certain things that it does really badly, I might talk about them at some point, but... But it's funny how slight slight changes can make such a difference to a game. Even this game, the difference in playing it 
uh, with the Wii versus playing it with the uh, with the GameCube is pretty interesting. Um, I find that my playstyle is actually a little bit different. Having the free aiming, um, it makes me tend to sit more in one spot as I fight things rather than moving around. Uh, especially because the the one problem, like, so the way Samus's movement is controlled is obviously through the 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 Wiimote pointer. So as you point it at the screen, you can point your gun, and if you point it off to the side, Samus will look in the various directions. But there's sort of a gutter beyond which, if you you know if you move the controller too far off to one side or too far to the to top or the bottom. You've moved it past what the what the Wii controller thinks of as the edge of your TV. So, so you've got kind of this. It, it's kind of finicky. You know, if if you move it off too far in one direction, then suddenly you f you start moving much more slowly. So if I move to the right, I move fast. But if I move a little bit too, f oh, actually it locks in. But then I can't. Then it's harder for me to stop my movement. So I, it just tends to make me a little bit less maneuverable than with than if I was using a thumbstick to move left and right and what have you. Um, I also rely a lot less on the uh, a lot less on the lock on and and because of that also a lot less on the strafing. Anyway, at some point. At some point, the game is going to decide I don't know where I'm going, and it's going to kind of nudge me in the direction of the sun chamber, and it's going to tell me that the source of the toxin has been detected. Because by this point in the game, um, you've discovered that there's poison... Whoop, I didn't lock on. You've discovered that what water remains here in the Chozo ruins, which, as I pointed out last time based on the architecture, was obviously... De designed around both water and plant life. Um, what water remains here is badly poisoned, so that if you even come into contact with it, it, it injures you. So, oh, here we go. Incoming scan data. It's telling me fluid patterns analyzed, main source of toxins and ruin detected. So it's kind of giving you this this little plot point of, you know what, maybe it's time for you to do something about all this toxic water that's poisoning the environment, killing all the plants, and I'm just going to wipe out these war wasp hives so that I don't have to deal with the war wasps. Oh, wow, I, as I hit, as I shot the missile past those leaves, leaves popped off, eh, that's, but it didn't do it again. So we're now going to go and deal with the poison. What's interesting is also that the game sort of gives you a little bit of a... I guess I guess we're going to call it a fake out here. Because as you've been reading the, uh, the Chozo lore, particularly the lore in that middle temple, uh, in the temple back in Talon Overworld that we went back to to start the artifact collection quest, um, the story thus far was that a meteor had hit this planet and crashed and basically buried itself in the planet's surface and started spreading something called the Great Poison. The Chozo tried to contain it, but were unable to. And ultimately, well, we don't know what their fate is yet. That's pretty much all we know of the story so far. Um, so you might connect that to all of this poison water. Um, and so the, the idea of curing the, curing the poison, uh, implies that you're already wrapping up that, that sort of Chozo plot, and as we're going to discover, that's not quite true. Metroid Prime, it, um, is a really neat example of an alternative to three-act storytelling, that is highly effective in D&D. Oh, I'm just going to stop a second to, to call attention to this room. So now we're going to use the upper exit in this room. And when we climb all the way to the top, 
we discover that there is one another one of those doors that is locked by four four symbols and we need to scan all four of the symbols to unlock the door so if we get all the way to the top and then uh before we scan them all whoop, oh i haven't scanned big energy energy yet so if you get all the way to the top before you've before you've started scanning the energy, uh, before you started scanning the symbols, uh, whoops, um, then you kind of, you, you're basically forced to backtrack through the room. So we're going to do that on our way up. Also, if the, if that venomous crabgrass is up, you can't scan the symbol. You just get this little warning that the symbol, there's probably a symbol under there. Um, also the venomous crabgrass is a, is a scannable creature. It is one of the, the creatures required for 100% scans. But you can't scan that particular clump because the other scan overwrites it. Um, you'll also note kind of, kind of in standard Metroid fashion that I couldn't make my way up here without both the morph ball and the morph ball bomb. Because I couldn't get through that little tunnel. Which is what keeps me from breaking the sequence and getting to the... Shit! Damn war wasps! I hate those things so much! You know, they're, they're like the freaking Medusa heads from uh, Castlevania all over again. They don't do any damage, but... They knock you all around, and they, they knock you off the platforms. And you're not really aware of where the edge of the platforms is. So, uh, and actually, you know what, that's something that you sort of learn to compensate for as you, you know what, let me, yeah, screw you, die, end your hive, how do you like that? So that's something that you sort of learn to compensate for, you sort of really start to hug the walls and to keep yourself backed up against obstructions when you're doing any sort of difficult platforming. Um, you also try to, if you're smart, you try to engage as many of the enemies as you can before you start doing the platforming in the room. Um, which leads to sort of this, this standard operating procedure for rooms where you stand in the doorway, kill everything you can, then you kill all the monsters, then, or, I'm sorry, kill all the monsters, then you look around for anything you can scan, then you make your way to an exit. And now we got the entry for the crabgrass, which we shoot to make it retreat into the ground, and then we roll past before it comes back out. That crabgrass will actually damage you. I also haven't been keeping my eye out for for the uh, the actual runic symbols, and I think I skipped one. That's great. So I think we're going to end up dropping all the way back down again, aren't we? Uh, yeah, we are. I done fucked up. Remember when I was bragging about how well I know this game? <laughs> so, we're missing two symbols here. Uh, and I know we're, that they're both on the climb up, so we're just gonna... What were the chances I would actually drop between those two platforms, huh? Oh, I never noticed... Oh yeah, the the plants are dying because of all the le of all the poison. Oh, there's also a slight there's also a slight ping noise, um, which I never noticed because I never played this game wearing headphones before. Which I have to say also makes it a lot easier to hear the uh, that this the warm warm sound that the power ups make the, the I'm good which I'm gonna call the power up warble, just so that I can keep stop imitating that noise. You know it's kind of similar to uh, what Super Metroid. Whoa, I got a jump happy there, didn't I? It's kind of similar to what Super Metroid did by displaying the dots on the map to indicate where the power ups were. So that you're not completely blind if you're trying to hunt through the whole game and look for everything.
Alrighty. And we come to a dead end, which, of course, obviously isn't. And more sandstone. I don't know if I mentioned this last time, but the game uses kind of these... The names of materials as a clue to what item... Or, yeah, to what item will break it down. So, sandstone, you use your, um... Use the morph ball bombs to get through. Apparently, the it is the gardener's day off. Talon Four is like just one one big brutal ecosystem. Everything is toxic or deadly. It's like the friggin' Australia of the Galactic Federation. Of course, it it, it would be more like Australia if like half or. Or, or, I mean, that, damn it, never mind. Forget it, the joke failed. Moving on. So now we encounter the first real official boss of the game. I mean, I, I fought a few other boss-type creatures, but they were mini-bosses, and this is the first real... The, this is like the Kraid, or the Ridley, or the Fantoon of this game, or one of them. I guess not. I guess the the parasite queen on the on the spaceship counts. So of course we're gonna scan it. Jesus, why don't you buy a valve? Flagra. All right, and that sort of gives us the, the basic instructions for beating this boss. Okay, kill it just with weapons fire. But we can daze it. The real key is that these mirrors reflect the sunlight onto it and keep it active. So you take out the mirror and it passes out and its roots retract. And for whatever reason, um, it has these morph ball bomb slots underneath it. So then you go and you drop a morph ball bomb and... Because gameplay, that's why. That's the reason, because gameplay. And then the creature withers and dies. Except not, because now two mirrors fall down into position and it's like, okay, you figured it out with one. Can you do two? Uh, also... In addition to Flagra being scannable for 100% scan completion, uh, Flagra's tentacle also needs to be scanned. So that's a missable scan that can kind of screw you up. Uh, I don't know if you just caught that, but if you leave... If Flagra sees that one of the mirrors has gone up, after a moment it's going to knock it back down into position. Which is why it becomes important to kind of try to keep Flagra stunned. And we're going to use the Morph Ball to get a little extra speed. And Flagra has become conscious again. So we're going to try and keep its attention so that it doesn't knock the mirror down and undo the work we did. I kind of... I really like this, um... I, this boss fight. I can't remember who said it, but I heard someone talking about it once refer to it as a plate-spinning boss fight. Where, you know, you've got to keep the mirrors up. You've got to keep Flagra from dropping the mirrors down. You've got to move fast enough between them. And you've got to get everything into just the right position so that you can actually damage the boss. So it's like trying to keep a bunch of plates spinning. And I thought that was a really apt description. The major... And the boss fight... Whoa. Uh, okay. That was a little uncalled for. Oh, I'm locked onto Flagra, not the mirror. Flagra's stunned. 
try to keep an eye on Flagra so that I can see when she becomes unstunned. Damn it! She undid the mirror. Uh, at the same time, I am going to say that this boss fight is one of those boss fights that kind of overstays its welcome just a little bit. I'm over here. Damn it. Especially because Samus is just a little bit too slow for this. Stunned again. Lock on! Did I do it? Alright. The other thing I feel, um... This boss and the Incinerator boss, boss both sort of violate the Cardinal Nintendo rule. And the Cardinal Nintendo rule for boss fights is that when you figure out the puzzle to the boss, you have to do it three times to prove that you got it, and then that should be enough to win. This one makes you do it four times. And... So did the Incinerator drone, and I... Th so do a lot of the bosses. Uh, I will also say this is one of the boss fights that uh, has a little bit of a... is actually a little bit trickier with the Wii controls because the lock-on doesn't just automatically target. You still have to point the mouse at the right spot. So it's... It's a little bit easy to miss the mirrors. Yeah, keep your attention on me. Especially because um, the mirror, the, the hot spot for the mirror slightly changes position as it goes up. I also haven't really talked about it, but the rate of fire on the missiles, I probably should have talked about it a little sooner than now, but uh, there's a little trick you can use um, in the game. I'll show you in a second. But there we go, and Flagra is taken out. And that is how poison works, of course. As, as soon as the source of the poison is uh, taken out, all of the poison in the entire world is... Or all of the water in the entire world is immediately purified. Uh, that is actually true, by the way. Um, all of the water now in the Chozo Ruins is pure now and safe. So you actually did render a change to the environment, which is kind of neat. We also get... Uh, have I scanned those locking mechanisms yet? Yeah, I have. And this is one of the... One of the first major... Or this is the, uh... The first major suit upgrade. Which is the Varia suit, which has been around since the first Metroid game. Though it was originally intended to be called the Barrier suit, but because of a mistranslation into English, it became the Varia suit. Um, and the barrier suit, or the varia suit, uh, reduces slightly the, the amount of damage you take from enemies. Um, I don't even know if it reduces damage in this one. In previous ones, it supposedly reduced damage by half. Um, but you also got it a bit later in the game. The other big thing is that it protects you from extremely high temperatures. 
so that it allows you to go into the superheated areas. Now also, uh, interesting note here, this is too long for you to jump. You can't possibly jump that water. So you are forced to walk into the water at this point, which does two things. Number one, it shows you that the water is no longer toxic. Okay, so if you've fallen into the water already, you now learn that the water is not toxic anymore and you don't have to be afraid of it. So it kind of forces you to expose yourself to the water right away and discover that. The other thing is that this is the first time in the game that you can actually go deep underwater. Uh, I mean, there are spots where you can go deep underwater before now, but this is the first time where you actually have to go underwater and see that you can go underwater, but also discover that your visibility and your mobility are both severely hampered being underwater. Okay. Um, if you've played previous Metroid games, uh, well, if you've played Super Metroid, then you'll know that the gravity suit is what's going to help you uh, against the water. But this is already kind of foreshadowing the fact that you're going to need something. That you're probably going to encounter more water, and water is, even though it's no longer dangerous to you, it is still a major inconvenience. We also now have encountered the first enemy that we can't... that we need a different beam weapon to engage with, but we don't have that beam weapon yet. And these bamboos are interesting too because if you charge your weapon, it pulls them in. With a little bit of a surprise. And it's kind of neat that they teach you that now because there are areas later where not knowing that is kind of disastrous. Now one of the one of the things that previous Metroid games have done with the with the Varia suit is the Varia suit opens up the hot area of the game. I mean that's what it did in Super Super Metroid was to was to allow you to explore Norfair, which was the lava area. But before you got the Varia suit, you were forced into Norfair briefly so that you could discover that there was this superheated area and there were these places you couldn't go without cooking to death. So when you found the Varia suit, it sort of, it you know, that told you, that kind of pointed you in the direction of going to that major, that major lockout. This game didn't force you through its lava area yet. Um, in fact, we haven't seen it because... Um, you know, I didn't bother going there. It's sort of out of sequence to go there before now. So, it loses some of its signaling over over uh, Super Metroid. Which it makes up for by using that the uh, the guidance of the, the map, the scan data. Where it tells you, oh, go here next. Now, while I like that guidance, and I think it's effective... Um... I'm also going to say that it was there to cover up slightly poor design. Because the game does not do a good job of telling you where to go next. And if you don't explore very thoroughly, um, every time you get a power-up, you, you kind of end up a little bit lost. You, you kind of end up at a, well, now I'm at a loose end. Where do I go now? So, meanwhile, we are going to head down to Magmore Canyon or Magmore Caverns now, which is the next place that the that the game expects me to go. And Magmore Caverns actually has some of the coolest music in the game. So, uh, and actually I'm going to shut up for just a second so that you can hear it, because there's actually some neat stuff that the game does with the music design too, so... So you can see that the music fades from the elevator music into the into the music for the area, but I'm just going to let you enjoy the music for a second.
Now, what's neat is that this music that you're hearing now, the, the Magmore music, is what they call the outer Magmore Caverns music. Each area actually has several musical themes that are sort of built on the same motif. And when you get into the area, into the area proper, um, it sort of adds as a as another layer the the rest of the music on top. And then when you get into what you might call the deep area of the of that area, then you get another musical theme that is actually a bit different from the previous one. So as we get close to the transition, I'm going to shut up again and show that off. Only because I think it's a neat way of indicating your depth in the area with musical cues. We're also getting introduced to some new enemies here. And had I come down here... Um, had I come down here before, before I had the Varia suit, first of all, I would have been taking continuous damage just from the temperature of the area. Um, second of all, I, I would eventually have gotten a text warning on screen saying, you know, this area is really, really hot and maybe you should head back until you, uh, until you get a power up that protects you. I do not have the reaction time to deal with those guys, because you can only hurt them while they're out of the ground. I like the, the helmet effects in this game. I like that the game is reminding you that you are actually in a helmet. One of the coolest, I think I can trigger it like this, is watch this. No? Nah, okay. Every once in a while when there's a bright light in front of you, uh, you can actually see Samus's face... Oh. Okay, see how it's... Alright, now it's overlaying the real Magmore Canyon's music over the outer Magmore Canyon's music. This is actually one of the most popular uh, uh, bits of music in the Metroid series. It, this is... um. A, a redo of the uh, the Norfair music from Super Metroid. I guess I should have should have slowed down so you could read that if you wanted to. Now here's one of the more annoying things about this game. Because you are required to scan all of these utility things to get 100% scans. Uh, this is a, a, a grapple point so that once you get the grapple beam, you can swing across these things. The problem is it doesn't actually get report, recorded to your logbook unless you scan it after you have acquired the grapple beam. I don't know why they did that. Also, these puffers are kind of obnoxious when you kill them. They spread a green cloud that damages you before it, until it disperses. So you end up shooting them and having to wait. And as a general rule, um, having to wait as a mechanic is always annoying. That Magmore dragon just kind of went and hid in the lava. Oh, so I wanted to talk uh, briefly about the rate of fire on the on the missile launcher. The missile launcher has... It's got this kind of neat animation where after you fire a missile, it's got to rotate and put another missile into position. See? Um, and that kind of slows down your rate of fire a bit. You can't just fire repeatedly. However, if you fire your gun in between missile shots, it sort of cancels out the animation and gives you a much faster rate of fire. So it's just a neat, neat little thing you can do. But again, I also really like the attention to detail it shows where they, where they, you know, made that, 
Obviously, they lowered the missile rate of fire so because missiles are more powerful than your shots. And, you know, you've got to balance it out. But then to, um, then to solidify that with the animation and, and make it an animation about loading a new missile into the, into the clip or into the gun, kind of neat. As we get more beams, I'm also going to point out the different ways that the game balances out the different weapons to, uh, differentiate them, even though they're basically all just arm cannons. We got another new creature down here. These little guys are cute. These little bastards are called the tr Triclopses. Hard tripar tripartite mandibles. <laughs> uh, somebody had a thesaurus or, or, or a biology textbook. So these little guys, um, if you're in morph ball form, they will pick you up and do a little bit of damage as they deposit you out of the area. But they will also pick up anything, including a morph ball bomb, which does not work out so well for them. So what you have to do is you drop a morph ball bomb and then get out of the way so they grab the bomb instead of you. Which, I find that hilarious. I don't know why. Oh, here we have another, the, the condensation on Samus's helmet, another really cool effect. Um, and before we go forward, we're actually going to explore down here, because while we pass through this area... Magmore Caverns is kind of a, um... Kind of a, a transitional area. As an area, there's not much to it. You end up passing through it a lot to get to other places. Damn it. Uh, if you jiggle the controls, you, you can get the, uh, the Triclops to release you early. And somewhere here is a hidden, hidden little hole to another area, which is, ah, let me go, let me go. No, put me down, drop it, drop it, now fetch. Some reason this makes me think of the, um, there's a great video on America's Funniest Home Videos where a uh, family was setting off fireworks and the firework kind of goes astray and it lands out in the field. Um, and it hasn't detonated yet or it's... or it, Oh no, you know what it was? It was like one of those Roman candle things that you set in the ground and it just starts launching stuff. So they, they have it out in the field and they light it and the guy runs away from it. And then the dog runs and he picks it up and now he's holding it in the side of his mouth and he's running after the you know, his master and everybody else while this thing is just like launching things out of the side of his face in random directions. And I should point out the dog was perfectly fine. So that nobody gets upset with me. Even so, I am a little bit uh, disturbed to admit what I find to be hilarious. Um... <laughs> Honestly, America's Funniest Home Videos is the only TV show left that I watch on, like, a regular weekly basis that I make sure I do not miss. Uh, also, this, this room is a good spot to point out um, the respawning mechanic. Um, you might notice that enemies respawn after I leave rooms, but you have to get two rooms away. They don't respawn if you only go one room away. Which makes it a little bit convenient to duck into one room. Oh, those platforms sink. The little... Shit, and the lava hurts. Actually, I gotta say that, you know... <laughs> Samus can kind of take the lava like a champ, huh? But those circular platforms with the little... Little saucer sections on the bottom... Those platforms sink if you stand on them. So, so they kind of force you to move a little bit quickly. Uh, which, again, I mean, the platforming in the game is pretty good. Overall, I've said that it handles pretty well. 
as first person games go um you know, I, I'm not a fan, in general, of platforming in first-person games. And different first-person games obviously handle it better than others. You know, we, we give Half-Life a pass. Half-Life, I think, was really the first game to, to do heavy first-person platforming. And it handled it okay, but it was such a well-done game, and it was so unlike any other game that had come before it, that I think we gave it a pass, even though if you go back and try and play it now, the platforming is really shit. Um, this game gets a pass because the controls handle it pretty well, but even so, uh, a lot of the platforming is, is uh, obnoxious at times. And um, what else? Oh, uh, what was I playing recently? Oh, Borderlands. Borderlands was neat because it had some platforming areas, some tricky platforming areas, but all of the tricky platforming was restricted to optional side quests, and usually it was like the those collection quests, like you know, go into an area and get all of the all of the audio logs or something like that, or or find the um, those find the little scrap bots, uh, the little um. Whatever those, whatever the hell the little robots were called, find the damaged robots quests. There was uh, platforming in that. So again, I'll give Borderlands the pass on that one. But so, oh, I guess I should be commenting on the the architecture here because we've been seeing a lot of mechanized. Well, we've been seeing lava caves, but also this mechanized shit everywhere, stuff, things. And now we start to see computer consoles. And start to wonder about what this stuff is, because it is distinctly different. It's got kind of that Z-Rust look compared to the, even the technological areas of the uh, Chozo ruins. Indicating that it's not quite the Chozo ruins. And now we get... Sort of this clue about, oh, Phazon. We've heard that before. That's what the space pirates were talking about. And now we get this this neat little thing about, oh, the, um, you know, these these crystals, these crystals as a byproduct of our Phazon operation are useless to us, but we can sell them to someone else. And, oh, this is re Report Predator Activity to Security Central. So... Now we're starting to get this implication that there's some other operation going on here on the planet. And that it is, in fact, the Space Pirates. That they have all... that they have been here. Um, there's also a secret here. Now, the way to get this secret is to use the triple bomb jump. But notice that it's above these little... these little, um metal blocks that break away if you if you drop the first bomb on the metal block it just cracks if you drop the second one it actually breaks away and then it takes a few minutes to come back but in the meanwhile it will drop you in that lava so this is a really this is one of the more pain in the ass optional power ups to get but as I mentioned last time the Wii added the bomb ju the, the jumping ability to the morph ball which suddenly makes this one really trivial. Oh, hey, Litwafa... Litwafa 1208. Um, hello. Welcome to the chat. Yes, the damned space pirates indeed. And now we are finished with our first visit to Magmore Caverns. And... As I said, Magmore Caverns does serve as just kind of a transitional area, um, connecting the other areas of the game. And you're never really going to hang out and explore Magmore Caverns so much as you're going to just pass through it. Okay. So now here we are, because connected directly to the lava area is the frozen ice area. Naturally, because that's how ecosystems work. And this area is Fendrana Drifts.
and again, I'm I'm letting the Fendrana music kind of fade in so that you can hear how it uses the the musical cue here. We get sort of the the Fendrana drifts bass line here. And then when we get into the area proper, we'll get the real Fendrana Drifts music. And then when we find the deeper areas of Fendrana Drifts, we're gonna we're gonna get um and in fact Fendrana mu Fendrana's Drifts actually uses uh, additional music cues later on too. I love the the floating rock platform has an, somebody built a propulsion system into its underside. Okay, you can see that it actually has a rocket and a tube fueling the rocket to keep it aloft. And you know, you look at that and you're like, oh, neat. They kind of explained, um, you know, why are these platforms floating? That's so neat. And and then you you think about it a little bit more and you're like, why why would they do that? Why not a ladder? You know, vertical ascent is a problem that has been solved on Earth for thousands of years with the invention of stairs and ladders and more recently escalators and elevators. At no point did we feel the need to create rocket-propelled flat-topped rocks that we would have to backflip between, you know, in order to get to higher areas. Now we also get we get to a save station and we get a little bit more scan data here. And now this is mentioning a research facility and another research lab, also ballistic support. <laughs> and again, now we're, we're, we're still starting to just get clues that there's some other operation going on on this planet. We don't know quite what it is yet, but we're going to guess that it's the pirates. Um, and that the pirates have been gradually entrenching themselves on this planet. But we also, for whatever reason, they are staying out of the, uh, the Chozo ruins, the Chozo temple. I'm surprised, too, at some point the game hasn't decided that I'm, I don't know where I'm going and sent me the scan data for the next, telling me uh, what to look for. These little guys can only be beaten with missiles, at least for right now. Uh, also, flicker bats. Let's, let's... He got out of range. Still pushing for our 100% scan data. And then then I will have finally beaten my white whale and I will have my Moby Dick happy ending. Uh, which I assume is how, hap uh, how Moby Dick ended also. Uh, I never read the whole thing. But I figure in the end, um, Captain Ahab finally defeated the evil whale that had attacked him. And all was, you know, all was well in the world. Okay. This this grate is actually interesting because it breaks the rule. Everything else that is bombable is sandstone. This, for whatever reason, is... Oh, wait. Well, that's because it's not bombable. It's missileable, isn't it? Yeah, it's missiles. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> I was wrong. I thought missiles were cordite. No, no, cordite is uh, super missiles. Oh. I... One of the things, um, like, I found, too, that playing this with the Wii instead of the GameCube controller, one of the things is that I rely slightly more on missiles uh, until I get some different beam weapons because they have a slight tracking ability. And precise aim is a little more important, even with the lock-on. Oh. oh. And now we see another one of these bamboos. 
uh, the scatter bamboo. Now these things follow a limited patrol path and just just um, spread. But what's neat is that their electrical interference also interferes with the visor. Again, I just keep going on about the, the visor effects. Damn it. Also, if you've been paying attention, you might notice that this tunnel is very similar to the tunnels in the Chozo ruins that connect different areas together. And now we come into these... into these ice ruins, basically. These frozen ruins. Which tells us again that the Chozo had a presence in this area. Whoa. So these are baby she-goths. Um, they're invulnerable from the front, but um, the hard shells on their back can be broken. Whoa. Uh, and then... So you end up doing a lot of circle strafing to get around them. Or you can pump a couple of missiles into them. And then once you expose their... their whoops. Oh, they also have that freezing breath. And if you get frozen, you just have to tap the jump button until you become unfrozen. Why am I not locking onto this guy? Now I can hear a power-up warble, and this is another thing that maybe I will remember for later. Nothing that I have, uh, even though I have a gun that shoots concentrated, you know, energy bolts, that doesn't count as extreme heat, apparently. Uh, neither do missiles. And then we're going to... And, you know, one of the things, too, is that I haven't really talked much about traversing the different rooms. But one of the one of the habits that you got into is kind of looking at the minimap in the upper right to see where the exits are relative to you. And also to note that the exits on the minimap are color-coded to the beam weapons you can use to open them. Which will become more important as we start encountering different types of doors. But, um, so, like, I kind of, you know, I walk around the horseshoe of the room, I looked up and saw that there's this exit there, but I can't quite get up there, and then I work my way around using the platforming and find my way out. So the mini-map helps you find your way through the rooms. This beetle is actually, or this burrower is actually a different burrower from the other burrower. Palette swaps count as separate scans. I really hate these guys. I actually just don't have the have the timing finesse to get them. You have to hit them while they're out of the ground, obviously. And my reaction time just isn't that great. And now I can see I'm above that above the uh, the main plaza. I think it was called Finadrona Shorelines. And I can actually see across the way an ancient temple-like structure that I can't why get to yet um but again that's sort of the chozo's presence in this area and the bamboos i now know that i can't deal with and it's a good thing that the game has let me see one at a time you know see one or two of them already so that i didn't walk in here charge my weapon and then immediately get slammed in the face by three of them In general, one of the things that all the Metroid games do very well is to telegraph stuff so that you're never really unprepared as long as you're paying attention. Yeah. 
so... You know, I talk about this game a lot in comparison to the rest of the Metroid series, and I've actually kind of critiqued it a little bit. Um, I've critiqued the platforming, I've critiqued the controls, I've critiqued the scenario design. And it's really funny because I do think of it, after Super Metroid, I actually think it is my favorite in the series. You know, obviously, Super Metroid is the best, and anyone who says otherwise is a filthy liar. But Metroid Prime is... Uh, I consider it to be the second strongest entry in the series, and then Metroid Fusion. Um, and so, let's talk about a little bit of what it does right. One of the things that, that Metroid Prime did that the, the games that came before it didn't do is to add, add a substantial story to the environment itself. So, on this planet of Talon 4... There are actually two major plot threads going on. Uh, there's the one about the Chozo and their history and their background and their civilization. And there's the one about the space pirates and what the space pirates are up to on this planet. And obviously those two stories keep intersecting. Is this not where I go? Uh, maybe this isn't where I go. And maybe I'm confused. Oh yeah, I am confused. Okay. But... You know, the game doesn't... There are no NPCs to talk to in the game. Um, there's no real good story delivery methods. And so, the way it delivers its story is through two methods. Number one... Well, actually, it uses a lot of methods. But some are more subtle than others. Obviously, the biggest one is the scans. And the fact that as you interact with the different little clues in the environment... You kind of... Samus infers information about what's going on um, based on the based on what she's scanning. Did I fall down? Yeah, I did fall down. That's okay. Um, and between the text logs that the pirates leave and the... Can't blow up those crates? Okay. And the text logs that Samus leaves behind... Um, you know... You can start to put the story together. At the same time, though, the story, as voluminous as it is, is entirely optional. You know, you can go through this game just like you went through Super Metroid or Metroid or Metroid 2 and just follow the, the power-ups and, and follow your own exploration and beat this whole game and never care about any of the backstory. Um... The backstory itself is optional, and you have to discover it. But at the same time, because it is discoverable, it fits the overall theme of Metroid of, you know, empowerment through exploration. That is, if you want to know the story of the game, you've got to do what Metroid is about. You've got to explore the world, you've got to interact with it, and you've got to put all the pieces together. You've got to find everything. And then, in order to... In order to really incentivize going through the story, it added it added that sort of the scavenger hunt percentage of completion get the best ending thing so that when you beat the game at the end um you know it tells you how how much of a percentage of the game you completed and um and that sort of entices you to go back and play it again and go back and see what you might have missed and maybe to expose yourself to more of the story. So the story is something that you may gradually receive through, through further playthroughs if you decide to engage with it. And if you decide you don't care, well, that's fine too. Um, it's, it's actually a really effective method of storytelling, but the scans aren't all that, that Metroid Prime is doing to share the story. Number one, as, as I said, it, it uses... Well, I guess that's not number one. Oh, I just picked up the boost ball. I guess I should talk about that for a second. So this the boost ball gives you a little bit of a speed boost. You can hold up to charge it and then release it. And then if you're in these U-shaped half pipes, you can use the speed boosts to propel yourself to greater and greater heights. You can also use the morph ball or the, the speed boost to dodge a bit while in morph ball form, but it's a little bit trickier to use that way. But anyway, the biggest thing that you can do is use those half pipes now to get to 
uh, areas you couldn't otherwise reach, like getting out of this room. And again, standard Metroid fare. I got a power-up now. In order to get back to the exit out of the room, I need to prove that I figured out how to use the power-up. And now I can get out. Anyway, um, environmental storytelling. So another big clue in the game's storytelling is the architecture. You start to learn to recognize the Chozo architecture, both their ancient stone temple constructions and their um and the the amount the the bits of technology that they use. Um and you know, like the, the Chozo wanted to build a sanctuary where they could limit the amount of technology they used in their life. And the Chozo ruins area kind of exemplifies that because most of the most of the rooms that are technological in nature are kind of hidden away behind the facade of the of the you know all the stone temples and and all the all of that sort of thing which sort of tells that although the you know the Chozo wanted this you know this sort of ancient at one with nature kind of a, a construction, but they didn't really eschew all their technology. They were just really good at making the two meld together and hiding the technology away. On the other hand, you you also get oh, here we have a cutscene by the way. This is the this is an important cutscene to remind us what we were doing. Shows us that Ridley is yes indeed still flying around on the planet. And Ridley's appearance here in Fendrana Drifts rather than anywhere else in the game is also telling of something that becomes a little... But anyway, so the architecture also tells the story. The space pirate architecture is much more clumsy. Uh, n not clumsy, but it's more... Uh, more based on polygons and, and, you know, hard edges and normal shapes, and it's just kind of built over or on top of the world around it. So it basically speaks of conquest, that we're basically coming here to, you know, take over, rebuild the natural world. They just, they hang, they hang these little view screens up on the inside of this room, you know, right over the Chozo architecture there. It's just, well, we'll put this shit up here. Um, they'll, they'll run their cabling for their save points anywhere. Though it's unclear whether the save points are Chozo technology or, uh, Space Pirate technology. But, so the environment itself and the architecture, if you're intent attentive to it, also tells a story. And, in fact, I'll, I'm going to point out some more interest in instances of that later on. Then, as I said... The, nar the music provides a number of narrative cues. Uh, I already talked about how the deeper into an area you go, the, um, you know, it has several layers of music that get laid over each other in the different areas to indicate your depth in that area. But there are also some other neat musical tricks that come up later on, um, which I'll point out when they happen. So, what all of that adds up... Oh, and by the way... Uh, I didn't say it, but now that I have the, uh, the, the morph ball, the, the morph ball boost, um, I've got to head all the way back to the Talon overworld to, uh, get the next power up on the critical path, which is kind of an obnoxious bit of, uh, sort of an obnoxious design in the sequence to g make me dip into an area for just one minute to get one thing and then go all the way back to the beginning of the game. But again, I'm, ta I'm talking about the positives here, not the negatives now, because I really do love this game. So, musical cues. Oh, and also this room. This room is a great example of the space pirate technology. So you just have this sort of weird, weirdly shaped, but ultimately very mechanical, rusty, sort of ugly con construct. Um, that I fell into the lava while I was admiring. Um. <laughs> Oops. But it, it speaks of the space pirate motives and the space pirate mentality. And also, it speaks of what they're doing here on the planet, where they just kind of 
built that on top of this cave, and this is this is actually their geothermal power center. So they are just extracting electricity from the lava. So all of that adds up to kind of a solving an interesting problem in interactive storytelling. Um, you know, obviously, as in interactive storytelling, in video games as well as in role-playing games, you know, we we we're kind of taught early on to to like love the three-act structure, and you know. The three-act structure, it's it sort of, you know, the first act establishes what the problem is. It, it ends with the presentation of a problem. It, it sets up a situation, here is the situation, and it ends when a problem has been set up. The second act is all about working to solve the problem, and the third act is ultimately the solution to the problem. Okay. But in interactive storytelling, the problem that you run into is that the first act of a story is actually really boring. And we want to get through it as quickly as possible. But in interactive storytelling, the, um, the protagonist is the audience. In this case, like me, I am not just a passive audience. I am also the hero of the story. And so I really do need to have a keen understanding of the first act because I'm the one who has to solve the problem. It's not just me watching a story about a hero who solves a problem. I actually need to feel like I am the one providing the solution, which means I have to understand the problem. So some video games will solve that and some role-playing games will solve that by having sort of the, the opening cutscene or the, the opening briefing or the setup that explains all of the backstory. Um, and that's why so many video games actually start with, in the beginning of time, the gods created the world and did this, and now all of a sudden all of that shit is a problem that has to be solved. Um, and that's why we sit through those cutscenes is because they sort of establish what we're doing. They give us the purpose in the game. But Metroid Prime um, is sort of a different class of storytelling. And it's not the only game that works like this, but it's a really elegant presentation of it. What Metroid Prime does is it actually takes the first act and doesn't make it part of... It doesn't make it... Doesn't put it up front. The first act of the story, that is what really sets up the problem, is the space pirates um, coming to... Well, I mean, honestly, it's all of the backstory. It's the Chozo coming to live here. It's the meteor crashing on the planet. It's the space pirates coming here to, spoiler, do whatever it is that... They, or not spoiler, I'm avoiding spoilers. Do whatever it is that they're doing here. You know, all of that is really the first act of the story. It's what it's what establishes what you need to do. And I know I'm being really careless and taking a lot of damage, but I get very impatient with the with this shit. Um Yeah, so anyway. So what Metroid Prime does is it actually number one, it makes the backstory optional. In that if you just want to play the game and engage with the game as a game you can do that and you won't find yourself at any sort of disadvantage and number two if you do want to engage with the story you don't have to sit through a 10 minute cutscene or read a whole bunch of of data up front you actually learn the first act in the second act by interacting with the story itself actually feel like there's another better way to get back to ta the Talon overworld, but I can't remember what... But, actually, I think I'm imagining that. <laughs> Whatever. Whoops. Oh, I don't know why I'm morph-balling into the... Um, meanwhile, uh, Iggy Midomi in the chat... Iggy Midomi? Okay, Iggy Midomi in the chat is saying, finds it annoying that the gravity suit in Prime never gave a full immunity to um, lava like Super Metroid. You know, it's interesting that you bring that up, because that actually, when I played Super Metroid, was kind of a screw-up for me. Uh, actually, it screwed me up. Like, 
Um, in general, Metroid is really good at helping you discover what it is that the power-ups do for you. And there's really nothing in the gravity suit that implies that it gives you immunity to lava. It was something that you just sort of discovered. But it's important that you figured it out because in the critical path through that game, the, the gravity suit was... Why aren't these... Pla oh, um, I was missing a platform. I was like, why aren't these platforms getting closer together? Um, so after you get the gravity suit, then the next place to go is to go down into uh, Norfair and go through the lava to the one door that you couldn't reach that leads you to, to inner Norfair and Ridley's hideout. But you are not forced at any point before you reach that room to discover that the gravity suit confers an immunity to lava. Like, after you fight... After you fight, um... Uh, what, what was it? Dragon. And get the gravity suit. There's not a room that that is filled with lava that you can't jump across or something um, that kind of forces you to fall into the lava or crackle blocks that trap you and drop you into the lava so that you can be like, oh, hey, look, I'm now immune to the lava. And I distinctly remember the first time I played Super Metroid all those long years ago that after I got the gravity suit for the first time in the game... I really did feel utterly lost. I had no idea where to go because I didn't connect the gravity suit with lava immunity and so I didn't follow the natural progression down into that down into Ridley's door. Um it took me a lot of flailing. Uh oh no, Dragon what well, Dragon didn't give you the gravity suit though. I don't know what the hell I'm thinking. Um yeah, but still it was that I hadn't rev I hadn't realized it, so I was expecting another power-up. What Dragon gave you the space jump, right? Uh, also, it's it's kind of interesting to note that I, I now have to fight the plated beetle out here. Um, and now Metroid Prime... This is something else Metroid Prime does a lot. Um, as you start backtracking through areas you've been to, um, you start to, the, the enemies in the different areas start to change. Um, and some of the ways that they change are interesting ways that the environment is responding to what you're doing, uh, particularly some of the space pirate areas. So it is, it's a neat way that the game implies that, that the, um, that the world itself is alive. You know, that, that it's kind of changing as you, as you change it. Uh, one of the best examples was uh, after you beat Flagra and the, the water becomes non-poisonous. That's, that's one of the neater, um, neater examples of transforming the world of non-permanence. Which is actually kind of a neat addition to Metroid, because the Metroid series is obviously all about empowerment through exploration. So Samus becomes more powerful as she explores the environment and can handle more things. But it adds another layer to it when exploration also allows you to take control of the environment way. That is to say, like you're actually not just, con you know, you're not just becoming more powerful, um, you're also conquering the environment. Um, and it, it's a really neat juxtaposition to fusion because fusion played with that sort of level permanence in the same way where, where the levels are changing around you, except what, what it did was that it was, um, it was the enemy. It was SAX, you know, dark evil Samus that was changing the environment to kind of disempower you, to trap you, to, and to hinder you, or just the the environment was falling apart around you. So, um, while Metroid Prime doesn't do it as strongly as Fusion does, it actually does it for a different reason. It does it to make you feel more powerful. Speaking of feeling more powerful, now we find the Space Jump Boots, which are one of the most empowering objects in this game. 
weapons. Um, unlike uh, in previous Metroids, they they do not give you the ability to jump endlessly. What they do is give you a double jump, so you can jump and jump again. Um, and at first that might seem like kind of a lame depower of Samus, considering she used to be able to practically fly. But flying in a in the three D perspective, or, or the, having a, a true space jump in a three D perspective, uh, would be really tricky to control. And uh, to its credit, Metroid Prime Two Echoes tries to do it, and the way it solves that problem is a little inelegant and clumsy, but I, it's the best it could do. But one of the nice things is that you're actually very maneuverable with the double jump. So that you can jump and then jump backwards. You can jump and then jump off to the side. You, you can jump, turn in midair, and then have your second jump. I don't know if it's easy to see all this stuff, but... So, it, it drastically increases your maneuverability and your platform ability and in a way that feels... Like it were... Oh, I'm going up to the temple. I shouldn't be doing that. I'm going the wrong way. Because now that I've gotten the space jump, there's nothing else here for me. I've got to head now all the way back to Fendrana. So again, not the best design for the critical path, but along the way we're going to stop and grab some power-ups now that I have the, the morph ball, uh, or the boost ball and the, and the space jump boots. Because again, 100%, right? Here's hoping. Get out of the way, Zoomer. Though, actually, I think when I get back to Fendrana, because, uh, where am I at now? About 90 minutes? Yeah, I think when I get back to Fendrana, we're, we're going to do a little bit of item collection. Um, and then, then I'm going to go ahead and, uh, cut off the stream there and call it a day. Can't waste the whole Sunday streaming. But we're going to get a couple of power-ups here. So the first... The f not the doorway. There's the door. So the first one is returning again to the Ruined Shrine. The Ruined Shrine... This room is one of the one of the rooms that you return to about four or five times, I think. Whoops. And I zipped right off the edge there, didn't I? We see one of these half-pipe constructions, so we can... So we go up this side, and we find uh, another missile. And then... Actually, in the main plaza that we just passed through, uh, there is another one of those little half pipes. Uh, actually, the half pipe thing. I'm sorry I didn't show it. Um, because, again, when, when the little, um, hey, you lost bro scan comes up, you know, after you, after you, after you wander around for a little while, if you don't know where you got, where to go, um, when the game gives you those little, maybe you should head in this direction things. The, uh, the, the hey, you lost bro, uh, thing after you get the morph, or the boost ball, is actually just, hey, I'm scanning for more half-pipe architecture. And then it points you back to the Talon overworld. Um. <laughs> but, and it actually uses that exact terminology. It refers to it as searching for more half-pipe configurations. So, I'm just checking my little checklist here. Ruined Shrine, Main Plaza, Gathering Hall. Did I forget one somewhere? 
Oh, do I really want to go all the way over there? Yeah, okay. As I said, I wrote down a checklist uh, just to make sure that I get all of the power-ups. Uh, I don't I don't know if I want to go. I'll be near the gathering hall another time. Well, we're going to skip that one for now. That's very dangerous, but what the hell? So, now when I'm when I'm entering the fine the temple at the end or entering the impact crater at the end and I only have 245 missiles and I'm at 99%, somebody remember that I did that. So that they could tell me, oh, you skipped the missiles in the gathering hall until later. Yeah, and I'm... Not engaging. Not in the mood. Oh! Oh, the war wasps gave up in here and became shriek bats. I guess I finally thinned the war wasp ranks. And actually, uh, honestly, with that whole changing environment thing, I'll tell you it's kind of a missed opportunity that after you blow up the war wasp hives, it's sad that the war wasp hives don't remember that they were blown up and then the enemies in the room change immediately after that. Uh, that that would have been just a cool way of, again, emphasizing your control over the environment. You know, I talked a little bit about fusion. Um, I don't know. I, you know what? I don't want to get into it now because I'm sort of wrapping up for the day. But I have to remember that See, Metroid Prime the, the, was developed by an American studio, by Retro Studios in partnership with Nintendo. And concurrently, the original Metroid team was developing uh, Metroid Fusion. And they both came out at the same time. But one of the neat things is that if you look at the way the two games are designed, uh, particularly the way they tell their story... They, they sort of show a difference between Eastern and Western game design sensibilities, um, which, which sort, of, um, sort of draws an interesting parallel to, you, you know, we talk about Eastern versus Western RPGs and the differences between them. And you can actually see some of those differences emphasized in the way Metroid Prime versus Metroid Fusion were designed. But I'll save that discussion for another slow part on my next episode. Oh, there, you see. You get sort of a, a little bit of a reflection of Samus there in the, in the visor, which I was talking about before. Yet another creature who has evolved to dive bomb and explode. Uh, and I think... I am not good at hitting those Shriek Bats. It's probably... It's a good thing they explode, because if they got a second chance at me, um, after completely evading my wild volley of, of um, power blasts... Oh, right, I can just double jump now. I'm not interested in you, Beetle. What room is this? Is this Fiery Shores? No. Hmm. All right. I don't know, I think the, I think there's another... Somehow I think I got a little thrown off my main... My, my normal uh, playthrough sequence, but whatever. I will make sure that I pick up everything.
hate the stupid patience puffers. I hate, in general, any monster that makes you wait pisses me off. But now with the double jump, we can actually just go over that fence, which is kind of neat. We don't have to go through the, the little triclops uh, cage area. Whoop, I really should have... Alright, I am being a little bit too impatient now. But whatever. Alright. I'd probably be less impatient if my aim wasn't crap, but it is, you know. Alright, we're, we're getting there now. I think just cut through the monitor station and... I am going to take out the missile launchers, though, because the missile launchers just wreck you. And there I, there I use the, the, the beam cancel to fire fire my missiles a little bit more quickly, as I, as I kind of described before. And actually, yeah, all right. I'm also trying to follow enough of a sensible route that at some point I do not have to do an episode devoted purely to me going back and getting all the stuff that I missed as I passed through an area. So it's like I really want to get stuff as soon as I can get get it. Like, I know, for example, I can get the, uh, get the artifact in here. And you know what? I think I'm gonna. All right. So... Now having the double jump, I can reach this platform and reach this bridge and unless of course I miss the jump. Uh cool v789 in the chat is mentioning that they are talking about uh releasing a new Metroid game for the Wii U. Um Um I haven't heard anything about it, honestly, but I also don't own a Wii U, so... And, in fact, kind of... Metroid sort of dropped off my radar. I hadn't even played Other M because I didn't have a Wii for so long. Oh, come on now. I forgot to double jump. That's what I get for, by getting distracted. So, no, I haven't heard anything, but... Uh, honestly... Oh, good grief. That's my fault. I don't know what, what the hell I'm doing. I'm just not even... I'm not double jumping. Um... I have a lot of trouble talking and playing video games at the same time, apparently, which is why I probably shouldn't be streaming games, but whatever. Um... Anywho. Um... Honestly... As much as I love the Metroid series, or actually I love certain games in it, and I love I love the genre that it defined, but at the same time, I also feel like the Metroid games have kind of they're kind of past their prime. Ah, prime! I, I didn't even do that on purpose. But you know, like the Prime series got a little bit more disappointing as time went on. As much as I like Fusion, it, it was a step down, I think, from Prime 1 and from Super Metroid. And um, Other M was just so, so depressing. Um, so it's like, I almost am not interested anymore. It's like, I just kind of want to let the Prime, or me, let the Metroid series be at this point. Let it be done with. You know, it's it said everything it was going to say. Uh, in the chronology, Metroid Fusion actually provides a really good ending to the story. But, oh, and meanwhile, by the way, um, I should be doing this. So this is a spinner device. By charging up and spinning while you're in it, 
Um, you know, that's standard pirate technology. Whoa. whoa, whoa. The controller just went crazy. Um, you know, standard pirate technology. You put your, you, you put your standard one meter metal sphere in there, and then you spin it around and around and around and around, and you can attenuate something. It's much easier than using a switch. So anyway, this is another one of the Chozo artifacts um, that you need to pick up 12 of in order to beat the game. Also, we see some Bendesium here. Bendesium is destroyed by power bombs, which we don't have yet. So I can't do anything with that. But now I've got another another pirate artifact, which means I'm that much closer to not having to backtrack through the whole game at the end and get all of the artifacts to unlock the final area of the game. Damn it, I missed the platform. Alright, this has just become a disaster. It was going so well for so long, too. Alright, let's, let's get back to Fendrana, save the game, and be done with it for now. And that'll... And actually, this, this is kind of weird. I didn't notice that, but... Um, the room respawned, even though I only got one room away from it. Uh, I wonder if, if there are any other rooms like that, or this is the only room that breaks the rule. I actually don't even need to hit the puffers with the uh, with the charge beam. A single shot will do it. You know, and I don't want to complain. Like I'm complaining about the uh, the artifact side quest, and I'm complaining about some of the back and forth. Um, like the the morph or the the boost ball to the space jump now back to Fendrana drifts. Um, as probably that's the most obnoxious diversion in the game other than the artifact collection quest at the end. Um, and look, I know that that whole thing is par for the course for a Metroid game that, you know, you, you're going to go back and forth and you're going to get gradually familiar. And because the environment does change a little bit by spawning different enemies, um, or allowing you to make, to get through rooms more easily with different abilities. Um, in the end, I just feel like this world is not as interconnected as Super Metroid. Um, and there aren't enough shortcuts to really get away with that, so they should have been more careful in how they designed it. And I just think in general their scenario design was a little bit more off. Uh, Iggy in the chat is also asking me, have I tried using the, the lock-on set to fixed instead of free view? And I'll just show that off briefly. Yes, I have. Um, so, you can actually set the lock on so that... Um, and now I just need an enemy to lock on to. It's more similar to the GameCube control. Whoop, damn it. Suddenly, I've lost my ability to jump. I was doing all the platforming so naturally. So, now Samus no longer can move the arm. You can't aim away from the target. You don't have free aiming. While you're locked on, you can't move the gun. And that's how the GameCube worked initially. Or, the GameCube version worked. Uh, and... You know what? Honestly, the reason I haven't turned it on and the reason I won't leave it on is because in my test playthrough, I did get really used to using the free aim. Um, and I actually started to incorporate it into my strategy 
um, where it was like I would lock onto one enemy and fire other enemies, or not lock onto an enemy at all and just wipe it out. So by the time I discovered that was an option, I was very close to the end of the game and had adapted myself to using the, the free look. 